The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is scripted, recorded, edited and narrated by Neil Fisher. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast, episode 141, in which we will be looking at season 2, episode 4 of the TV series, and episode 17 of the series overall, The Great Water. I'm still showcasing Watership Down themed art, details in the notes. Please let me know if you'd like your Watership Down themed art to appear as the podcast title image for an episode, with full credit given. Anyway, let's get back to our rabbit explorers. Currently locked in the luggage compartment of a bus heading for the coast, they hope. Season 2, Episode 4 The Great Water. The 17th episode of the Watership Down TV series was first broadcast in the UK on the 24th of August 2000. It was written by Anna Bork. There will be a link to the episode in the notes. This episode is the second part of a storyline that began with the previous episode 16, or episode 3 of the second season. It isn't really clear why this episode is called The Great Water rather than The Big Water. After all, that's the phrase used by Kihar in the novel, adopted by the rabbits of Watership Down. Perhaps the producers thought it would look more clear for those unfamiliar with the original. Kihar's phrase is a slight example of non-native spoken English, and great would possibly be the more usual phrase for a native speaker. Of course, Kihar is actually speaking the lingua franca of all wildlife, and later broken lapine, so the English he speaks is supposed to represent that. As we rejoin the action, the red bus headed for the coast continues its way with the expedition from Warship Down locked in its luggage compartment. The stairways are wondering how long they'll be stuck there. How long will the journey take? Dandelion points out that Ellera and Ravscuttle cannot ever have had an adventure like this. It was only that morning that they left Watership Down, since when they have had their adventure in the marketplace. Kihar has promised to meet them at the big water. Hazel hopes he will. As we see the title screen, Kihar lands on a fence post. He is exhausted trying to keep up with the bus, or the crew doobly do as he calls it, his lapine vocabulary slipping as he becomes more tired. The bus pulls up on a dirt road and the driver opens the luggage compartment and hands a female passenger her bags. Having no idea where they are, the rabbits take the opportunity to escape. The bus drives off. Pausing for a moment to sniff the air, Hazel concludes that where they are is like nothing they've ever known before. Bigwig agrees. Where on earth are they? Pipkin says he thinks they are at the Great Water. By sheer chance and good luck, with no awareness of where they are going, they have got off the bus right at the coast. Not only that, but this is the exact bit of coast that Kihar apparently is trying to get to. We are treated to shots of waves crashing against cliffs, including an apparent shot of the Durdle Door Rock Arch, which may indicate that the stretch of coast they have ended up at is to the west of the Isle of Purbeck, nearer to Weymouth than Bournemouth. Hazel says now they have to find their friend. Apparently, this is going to involve walking down the cliffs. Where they are is too exposed, and Bigwig spots a bird of prey. There are a lil about. Now, I'm not very familiar with the cliffs west of Bournemouth, which is where I assume they are, but I'm fairly sure they do not include convenient paths in the cliffs themselves, such as the ones the rabbits now use to get down to the beach. Such paths generally have to be created by human hands, giving rise to terrifying YouTubes of people negotiating such precarious paths inches away from a sheer drop. Hawkbit thinks they should go back. They've seen the Great Water and there is no sign of Kihar. However, Bigwig disagrees, unsurprisingly. Part of the path crumbling away under his foot tends to argue for Hawkbit's perspective. The first birds the rabbits encounter on their journey down the cliff is a colony of puffins. As I'm assuming these are the cliffs to the west of Bournemouth, this could therefore be the peninsula known as the Isle of Purbeck, where there is indeed a colony of puffins. For the first time, the Watership Down TV series has taught me something about British wildlife I did not previously know. And could this be a nod to the publisher of the original novel, Puffin having been the young people's arm of Penguin Books? The Puffin's initial reaction to being asked for directions by a group of rabbits is not friendly. So they unleash Pipkin's skills in talking to other animals, and he has more success. 
Meanwhile, Hawkbit is amused at the way male birds are sitting on nests, which look more like small grass huts, but Dandelion is more open-minded. The puffin Pipkin talks to is called Kiloki, and he has a northern English accent. We will come back to that. No sooner has Pipkin started to talk to Kiloki than the puffins are suddenly attacked by two aggressive seagulls with white heads and yellow beaks. Kaloki manages to fend them off as the rabbits realise they know so little about this place. Or, Bigwig points out, about seagulls. A strong wind blows, disorienting Hawkbit. He is right at the edge of the path, which crumbles away, causing him to fall. Fortunately, he lands on a ledge not far below. Hawkbit reiterates how little he likes this place. Meanwhile, at the top of the cliffs, Kiha has arrived, flying over the bus stop. He calls out for his friends in concern, but then spots a rocky stack out in the sea. Apparently this is also something he was looking for, and the rabbits are forgotten about for now. Down below, the rabbits spot Kihar and call out to him, but he seems too distracted to hear them. Kaloki the Puffin asks why they are calling a gull. They say he is a friend. Kaloki says gulls are enemies. Hazel tries to say that gulls are not all the same, but Kaloki is not having it. However, he offers to show the rabbits the best way down the cliff, not least because they need to retrieve Hawkbit. An excited Kiha flies around the rocky stack, calling out names of seagulls he recognises, one of whom is called Conrad, apparently. The other names he calls out are a bit unclear. They all show disinterest. Now, time for a little more pedanticism. All these gulls are white-headed with yellow bills. Kiha has a black head and an orange bill. This should be because he is from a different species to the common gull, which they clearly are. Black-headed gulls are smaller than common gulls and seem to range a lot more inland. They also, incidentally, do not have a black head for much of the year, as is clearly stated in the original novel, where by the time of the escape from Ephrafa, Kiha's head is white. However, the 1978 film ignored this, giving him the same look all year round for simplicity. He also, of course, looked good. And now the 2000 season of the TV series takes this a step further, merging black-headed gulls with common gulls, seemingly making Kiha's black head and orange beak just a unique feature of this one gull, much like Bigwig's furry cap. To be honest, I've always thought a black-headed gull would be too small to take on the likes of Woundwort, and their behaviour does seem a little less aggressive than the common gull, who could easily fight a large rabbit given their much larger size. So, although one can criticise the inaccuracy of merging the two species here, I cannot help but wonder if Richard Adams inadvertently did so a little himself, notwithstanding his accurate description of Kihar's head turning white. Anyway, the reason for Kihar's excitement become clear now. This is where his love, Katerina, lives, or his little feather, as he calls her. But all he can get out of the gulls, he asks, is that she is around somewhere. At the base of the cliffs, the rabbit have re rabbits have reached a beach, which the where they discover a thing called sand. Kiha has told Pipkin all about it. It is hot, which gives Hawkbit another reason for going home. At the top of the cliffs sits Katerina, a white-headed gull who Kiha seems to call Katarina in person. Excitedly, she and Kiha recognise one another. They fly off together as Kiha declares he is home forever. Oh dear, this isn't going well for the rabbits. Down on the beach, Pipkin falls in the water, which has a nice temperature. A wave sweeps over him. Fiverr comments on the variety of smells here. Dandelion has found an apparently dead jellyfish. Its smell isn't so good. Hazel says they should avoid touching anything unfamiliar. They need to stay focused on finding Kiha. Meanwhile, Kiha is trying to persuade Katerina to come to warship down with him. Not very successfully. They are interrupted by the arrival of a fishing boat, which causes Kiha's love to fly to it in search of food. The rabbits are still trying to spot Kiha. Hawkbit sarcastically suggests swimming after him. Meanwhile, Fiverr tries drinking the water in a rock pool. Bad move. Pipkin, of course, already knew the water was salty. This is another thing he might have mentioned before they all went down to the beach. Hazel comments again on how unusual everything is here, and is promptly nipped on the foot by a crab. Later, as they are making their way over rocks, shellfish start dropping all around them. These are being dropped by gulls to open them. Hazel says this is a good trick they should remember. Hawkbit urges Pipkin to talk to one of the gulls. He goes up to two of them, who are fighting over a clam, and is promptly chased by them. 
Hawkbit comments that Kaloki the Pum Puffin had a point about goals. Dandelion remarks that Great Water has some major drawbacks, an understatement if there ever was one. Katerina and a male gull are fighting over a fish. Kiha turns up with another one, offering to share, and Katerina promptly takes it from him. She mocks him for wanting to share, and her new friend joins in, telling Kiha to go back to living with floppy rabbits and calling him Ki-ha-ha-ha. -ha -ha. They both laugh at him as he slopes off. On a beach at the base of the cliff, the rabbits have noticed that the water is moving closer to the cliffs. Why could this be? Meanwhile, Katerina's new boyfriend invites her to come with him and destroy some puffin nests. Katerina, who was bored, is enthusiastic, but Kiha asks them why they want to do this. Katerina points out that he used to enjoy the puffin game, but he responds that he has learnt it is better to get on with your neighbours. Let's address something here. The whole point in the original novel of Kiha having a foreign accent was to emphasise that he came from a long way away from Watership Down and was an unfamiliar species. However, as we heard earlier, the puffins in this exotic far-off place have British accents, albeit northern ones and therefore still a bit, little bit exotic for a southern Englishman such as me. So in this animation aimed at children, we now have a very unfortunate dynamic. One where gulls, who sound East European, bully northern English sounding puffins apparently for fun. And where the only East European gull who has learnt not to do this is one who has lived under the civilising influence of rabbits who have accents from the south of England. What is this teaching those young people who watch this? Am I taking this too far? Possibly, but I doubt a children's animation made now would be quite so free and easy with the casual xenophobia. In any case, the two amoral, untrustworthy foreign gulls now proceed to attack the wholesome English puffin colony. The puffins fight back, taking off and tackling these foreign invaders in mid-air. An enraged Kiha intervenes, but not before a puffin I assume his Kaloki takes a few tail feathers from one of the gulls. Kiha bellows at them to leave the puffins alone. His rage is overwhelming, the angriest we have seen Kiha in this series. The two raiders withdraw, but not before Katerina tells Kiha that he has changed and is nothing to her now. Kiha lands and apologises to Kaloki for his stupid mean friends, not like rabbits, he has to himself sadly. Kaloki picks up on this, saying he must be the gull friend of the rabbits, and that Hazel was right, gulls aren't all the same. Kiha asks incredulously if he knows Hazel. Kaloki says they have gone to the beach looking for Kiha. Instantly, Kiha is alarmed. He knows the tide is coming in. Down the below, the rabbits are rapidly becoming trapped by the incoming tide. Hazel spots a ledge that they can possibly reach and they rush onto it, but the sea is still rising. It is night time now. Under a crescent moon, Kiha flies along the cliffs, desperately calling out for his friends. Sitting on the rocky ledge, Pipkin hears his cries in the distance and calls back. At last they are united. Hawkbit tells Kiha they are being swallowed by the poisoned water. Kiha says this happens twice a day, but it moves slowly. Bigwig asks how high the water gets. Kiha points to a level way above where the rabbits are now. Hazel spots a ledge above the high tide mark that will be safe, but Fiverr, who tries first, cannot make it up there. Kiha thinks about what to do, then flies off, saying he will be back and not to go away. Hawkbit's resulting sarcasm is spot on. Kiha lands among his fellow gulls and begs them to help his friends, but of course they are not interested. Katerina is especially scathing, her new boyfriend adding that rabbits do nothing for them. Kiha tells Katerina she has a hard heart with no room for Kiha or friends or good things. He is so over her. And so, of course, Kiha ends up at the Puffin Colony and asks them for help. A sleepy Kaloki asks why his fellow gulls cannot help. Sadly, Kiha says, because gulls are gulls. The Puffins go into a huddle and decide to help. After all, Kiha helped them against his fellow gulls. Kiar asks them to grab shells and stones, anything they can find, and take them to Flat Rock. Back at Flat Rock, the sea is getting higher. Hawkbit gets drenched by a large wave. They won't be able to avoid getting swept off for much longer. They wonder if Kiha has got lost in the dark, but Pipkin points out that he knows this place far too well for that. And now Kiha is back, telling them help is on the way. 
Hawkbit acerbically asks him if he got his goal friends to help. Kiha replies no, a bit sadly. And now the puffins arrive, dropping stones and shells onto the ledge. Kiha starts sweeping these together where, where the rabbits need to climb. They rapidly cotton on and help. Hawkbit and Fiver even retrieve a piece of floating wood from the sea. Echoes of the river Emborn? The platform is complete. All the rabbits make it to the higher ledge. Hazel is last. Just as he is about to scramble up, a huge wave looms over him, threatening to sweep him away, but he just makes it. Kiha says they should wait there until the water recedes, then get back up the cliffs the way they came. It won't be a long wait. Kaloki lands on the ledge and Hazel thanks him. Kiha says if he can help the puffins in any way he will. Kaloki remarks that he wishes more goals were like Kiha. Another puffin arrives with some food for the rabbits, a mouthful of small fish. Hazel tries to be polite, but Pipkin just picks one up in his mouth gratefully. The puffins say goodbye. Pipkin spits out the fish in disgust. Hawkbit says Kaloki isn't a bad sort, at least for a male who stays at home looking after the young'uns. The sexism of rabbit bucks has returned. Kiha looks longingly at the fish. Hazel tells him to help himself. Night turns to day. The tide recedes and the rabbits make their way back up the cliff. Looking out over the sea from the grassy cliff top, Hazel says it's time to go home. He asks Kiha if he is coming. Looking longingly over the big water, Kiha says he will miss some things, but he is going home too, to Watership Down. The rabbits are delighted. They all turn to the north and start to make their way back to Watership Down. And we never find out how on earth they managed it. Is it canon? Absolutely 100% not. But I do have to say that I rather like the altogether more serious Kiha we meet in this episode. Next time, we return to the politics of rabbit warrens. And there is the most unlikely alliance of the enemies of Watership Down. Mm -hmm.